My name is Owen Hopkins. I'm the director of the Farrell Centre, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first in our series of Towards Another Arch Architecture. This is organised by the Farrell Centre, which is a new public centre for architecture and cities in Newcastle in the United Kingdom and the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at Newcastle University. The starting point for the series is the realisation that it is now 100 years since the first essays that were later form Le Corbusier's Vers in Architecture were first published. Modern life demands and is waiting for a new kind of plan, both for the house and for the city, Le Corbusier declared. And today, I think it's fair to say that we live at another pivotal moment for architecture and indeed for the wider world. And this series posits that what we need to make sense of this moment is not a new architecture, as Le Corbusier was popularly mistranslated as advocating, but another one, an architecture uh, that is not bound to a single vision or future, but is diverse, pluralist, and sustains multiple conversations about the active role that architects might play in the world. So this series of events invites practitioners and thinkers working in a range of fields and geographies to reflect on this pivotal moment and advocate for their visions for another architecture. The format is a 30 minute presentation followed by 30 minutes uh, Q&A. So please have your questions ready. Um, I'm delighted this evening to welcome Studio Sidiana to kick things off. Studio Sidiana is an award-winning practice that works in architecture, design and research that's led by Alessandra Cavini and Giovanni Bellotti, who I'm very pleased is joining us this evening. They work across scales, they blur the boundaries between architecture, design, art, landscape and urban strategies. And their work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale this year, the um, Istanbul Design Biennale was also this year, Chicago Architecture Biennale this year, there's a theme going on here. Uh, they've had projects at uh, Arcdes in Stockholm, which I think was also this year, and uh, Het Nova Institute in the Netherlands. Uh, I won't introduce you personally, Giovanni, I hope um, that's okay. Uh, uh, but so I can move directly on to your presentation. Um, and the title they've given us is The Design of the Encounter. So over to you, Giovanni. Thanks a lot. Too many biennales, right? We're also a little bit worried. <laughs> Lots of biennales. Be I think yeah. we have to be careful now that you listen like us. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I will begin my presentation. Ale and I run the office together, of course, but uh, we found this format works a bit better. I'll share my screen and... Um, let me see if everything is in order. Oh, wait, let me do it again. Listen. Okay, do you see my screen correctly? Full screen with a title? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's good. Great, thanks. Um, so the... Wait, I just need to move this. There we are. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, what, I, what I would like to do today is actually to go through uh, four projects tonight. We discussed earlier. I hope I'll manage to get through all four of them in half an hour. But I, I think we got quite good at speeding up towards the end. And uh, they, they, they are four projects which are really all from this year. They were not all designed in the past year, but they all kind of saw, saw the, the, the light this year in this kind of short break uh, between lockdowns. And um, they, they all have to do with, with the theme, which for, for us as a studio, so for Al and me, but also for the, the team we work with, actually has become quite important and rather fertile. And it has a lot to do with, uh, with seeing, let's say, spaces and objects as a... As a almost as a form of, of mediation. So objects which have to do with relations between people, but also with other animals, with plants, with minerals or climates, which are kind of others to, to, to us or to the ones we, are, we, we feel uh, close to. Uh, 
And with us, I'd like to go through um, projects as a way to sort of to reflect and think a bit on architecture as a form of mediation and as a the project is a way of designing the encounter. Uh, not just between the aims, as I mentioned, but in a way also between different scales. And um, with scales, I don't just mean the sort of size of things, but I actually mean uh, maybe something in what's this, the space between representation and action, and uh, also where's the, how to kind of mediate or work between uh, quantitative scales um, and sentimental ones. And then again, maybe through the work, and this can maybe come up in the conversation a bit, is how to think about different kinds of authorship that as designers, let's say we find in the project across these different scales. And the first project I'd like to talk about, which is really already a collection of, of work actually, is called Variations and Advertage. And it's really, it, it, it essentially came together as one project uh, at, that we exhibited at Venice Biennale. <laughs> but uh, it's a really work that has been going on for the past three years. And the starting point is actually the birdcage. And uh, with that, we, we refer directly to the object that we can all sort of kind of picture, at least an image of in our mind. Um, but even more with the idea of the birdcage as a form of, as a sort of archetype. So we also relate it to uh, other um, tools, perches, bird feeders, but also to other scales. We think the dynamics of the birdcage actually uh, are reflected in aviaries, in zoos, in many ways, even in uh, preserves and national parks. Uh, so we kind of group a bit under the title or use it to work with around these series of inventions which have been designed to allow or but more often to sort of enforce some kind of human and non-human coexistence, more than to allow it perhaps to kind of institutionalize it, to give it some kind of form and rules and so on. So places where I think also we which are quite important to us because it's also where we we build uh, ideas of nature. And um, uh, we've, in particular, actually, we are very, we've been focusing and been very fascinated in, in birds. So bird cages, of course, in the objects, but in a way also in birds themselves. And for, for a few reasons, uh, the first is that we, we think that in birds almost being kind of a kind of a cliche, there's something very powerful. There's, there's an animal that in almost every culture connects the ground and the skies between heaven and earth and an animal that is also uh, in a very kind of literal way one of the biggest forces behind the, the globalization of nature along with second perhaps only two people birds as first seeds they adapt they migrate they exist in every corner of the planet so they're always around us they're the first to come uh, they're extremely close to us in the sense, and I think in another sense, they're almost in, inside us. The, the imitation of birds uh, precedes music, and music precedes language. So in a sense, they, they, they are they're in us in this way. But of course, they're also completely remote from us. We clearly do not speak the same language, nor feel the same feelings. And if any relation uh, we have with birds, it was it dates maybe 40 million years back in evolutionary terms. Um, and um, of course, the, the cage, we think, is a lot more uh, than, the, than the place of an animal in a house. Uh, it's in itself a small ecosystem. It has flows of energy. It's a place where death and life unfold. It's a place that needs, asks for maintenance. Uh, it's a place where energy is transformed. And it's a place that brings completely different ideas of, uh, or at least that kind of highlights the incongruity between different, complete different ideas of how to conceive a territory. So if for us, like intuitively, it's, has, it's a sort of geopolitical entity or even a nation state of sorts, uh, for a bird, that territory is a root or it's a sound or it's a space needed to feed or to make love for a season or for a lifetime. And it's something that, that changes constantly. So I, th I think this brings up one of the first kind of obviously sinister traits of the cage, uh, this kind of incongruity of scales. Another one is perhaps a burden of these metaphors. And in these paintings, there's, of course, there's a bird, but there's another, uh, there's other things being, being shown here. It's not just the, the birds being spoken about. It's also something about the construction of, of a family. It's something about the place of the woman. It's something about a precise idea of domesticity that I think comes from this specific genre of paintings. And still today, actually, most bird cages still look like a kind of miniaturized and uh, stylized human homes. Um, perhaps the, the analogy to the cage is also kind of striking, what at least for, for me, until I, I found this kind of analogy with the panopticon. It was 
uh, obvious but not as powerful. And actually, one of the ideas suggested by by Michel Foucault speaking about the Panopticon is that Bentham, the, the designer of this kind of ideal prison where a single guard could oversee hundreds of prisoners, had the menageries of Louis XIV in the style in mind. Um, so I think there's really quite a few layers to the cage, and there's also perhaps uh, reflecting on these various uh, kind of strata of it, one of the reasons why if we look at who is writing today in the fields of human animal studies, actually it's a lot of people that were working on gender and race or are working on that either come from that or move between the fields because it's still places where we address ideas of otherness and the forms of control. So this was kind of, uh, we think, a pretty thick system to move in for such a small object. Um, but it also like a rather, we think a rather powerful one, because I, I, I think there's something else that happens in, in the cage. It means that it's for sure like a way through which we look at others, but uh, it's also a place where we're being looked back, right? We, if we, we come to know or influence the behavior of another animal uh, through it, but we're also making our own behavior known and perhaps our own behavior is changing. So we started to reflect on, uh, on the bird cage as a form of language, so as a way in which we actually communicate, which defines birds as a pet or as exotic, as endangered. Uh, so it's a place where we kind of cast cultural categories on other, on other forms of life. Uh, we even define the ones that do not belong to the cage or get out of it as wild, as feral, as more invasive uh, once they, they escape. And of course, we define ourselves. You now we're the ones kind of inventing these definitions and um, kind of always in need of tools to mediate our relations with other forms of life. So what we started to do was to begin to collect, to design, to propose, sometimes to modify or to interpret uh, models of, uh, of cages. And we did this uh, through a, a collection of, uh, oh, sorry, skip the slide, through a collection of models, which for us are a, a very powerful tool. They, they allow, I think, to be the first moment in which capture at least one of the frictions between the scales I was mentioning earlier. They, they're always an object in themselves and uh, they're always a form of representation, the way at least we like to think of a, of a model. So they kind of invite other uh, authors, let's say, to interpret them. And uh, I'll go through just a few of the models that, uh, that we, we made, which were then exhibited uh, as part of our installation at the, at the Biennale this year. And uh, I, as I said, some of them were proposals, other were really like a way to look into certain artifacts that we found particularly interesting or that had a story to tell. And uh, the diagram you see here is of a structure which in Italy is called the uh, uh, rock column, which is um, where devices used since the 14th century and currently only kept for uh, kind of cultural preservation reasons. Um, to capture uh, live birds, migratory birds. And the way they worked was that a bird would be used as a, as a lure. So it would sing, it would attract other birds to a garden enclosure. So there would be a caged bird in a tower attracting other birds. There would be nets hidden in the shrubs around the perimeter uh, of this garden. And then once the birds would be, the flock would be attracted, the hunter would throw a decoy, which is called spauracchio, which is like something that brings fear. And then the birds would instinctively fly close to the ground and remain caught in the nets. So it's um, it's an obviously obviously a very violent uh, tool. It's a very violent kind of, of of architecture. I think there's perhaps a, some kind of degrees of violence in any form of relation we have with the others, or especially with other species. Uh, but this one is extremely explicit. It's uh, deliberate. It's a whole purpose. Of the of the of the, of the thing, but I think it's also it also has something kind of contemporary as a as an object. It's in part it's architecture, in part it's animal, in part it's human, and in part it's plant, and kind of all these things uh, work as one. This is uh, perhaps the world's most um, well known aviary. It's a snow the Bryce and Newby's uh, Snowden aviary, which was the first sort of walking aviary in the UK. And uh, of course, we, usually the, the attention goes to the, to, the, to the metal mesh, which already had a lot of nuances. It allowed uh, smaller urban birds to kind of fly in and out, but it was actually protecting the collection of birds of the zoo from, from bigger, from, from uh, predators. Um, but what we, the model we made was actually of the cliff, which at the time was already one of the most controversial parts of the, of the project, kind of man-made base, which had nothing uh, quote unquote natural about it. 
but which was meant to become the true aviary. So the mesh was supposed to be removed once the birds had kind of established their territory there. And these are um, another sort of rather I think, fascinating project that we found, which is these are sort of twin bat towers. One of them, they come both from the same patent, which was drafted by an American uh, uh, engineer and then acquired in Italy by a, a general, an army general. And this was happening in the 30s. And the intention in both cases, in Florida and in Sardinia, was to fight malaria. So they, these are buildings that come with a kind of early idea of what today we call ecosystem services. So the idea would be that we take care of the bats, the bats take care of the mosquitoes, and there's less malaria in the place. I, I, I brought it up also because I really love how the Italian one became a sort of small chapel. There's even a little prayer to the bats inscribed the, on, the, on its facade. And this was kind of our small tribute to this uh, strange uh, collaboration. So what we brought, and these were three of around 30 models, which it, it's, a, it's a group that keeps growing, let's say, um, which for us became a sort of, the sort of vocabulary of encounters, a collection of different kinds of relation. And um, the, the more we do those, the more we think that the, the cage is actually a very powerful place because in a way it's it's violent and very crude in the way it simplifies the world in the way it makes everything into in a way into a diagram or it cuts out and yeah and simplifies things that way but it's also a rare moment in which I think we can put together metaphorical quantitative and sentimental layers of the world kind of at one and that we're sort of forced to design them together to think of them together or at least to be explicit about leaving certain layers out and uh, so it sort of confuses a bit the distance between the, the idea of a species or a group and the individual, between the, the flock and the single bird. And I, what I want to do now is show a few projects which kind of took off from this idea also to sort of ground it and see a bit how they found some, some space actually as, a, as public space and as installation and as actual tools. And I wanted to start with some, uh, with, a, with a dove coat, with a um, one of the most, I think, fascinating architectural type uh, that we that we found uh, tied to one of the most fascinating birds. Um, and pigeons are an exceptional family of birds. They they relate to us to to people uh, with a kind of spectrum of relations which is huge and ranges from agriculture to communication to leisure to farming to warfare, and goes deep in in the field of metaphors. Not popes, revolutionaries, and saints all have been kind of liberating doves. And uh, even before 1910, which is, or well, a bit later than 1910, when actually uh, Faith Saba and Karl Bosch figured out a way to, um, to fix uh, nitrogen artificially, actually it was a lot of the guano that we had, which means a lot of the, of the nitrogen. So most of the fertilizers, which kind of allowed to grow, to grow food, were coming from, uh, from uh, guano and uh, bird droppings, essentially. So it was not just a cap to human population, but it was also a source for explosives. So the beginning of wars was tied to the availability of, uh, of nitrogen. So in a way, it's an animal that has been really designed by people, first to be domesticated, maybe in Egypt, um, but it's tied to wars, it's tied to politics, to economy, and today it's somehow a sort of urban uh, nuisance or somewhat unnecessary. So we made actually a series of tove coats over time. These we, we made in our own studio. We made them as modules in different materials from hempcrete to rammed earth. We installed them and we began doing this uh, during a residency. We installed them in mastic. We didn't start to keep pigeons, which is a rather kind of demanding activity, which we take far too seriously to kind of uh, begin to entertain for an exhibition. But there were kind of ducks living in the garden and they we found that they are absolutely um, well, unapologetic, they just uh, started to occupy the pigeon lofts and peek inside. And um, we then brought this on um, in the following years, really. But this is an installation we had for the Venice Biennale, which is our sort of favored pigeon tower, which in Venice echoes the, the bell towers of the city and um, sort of protects a flock of Venetian birds. It's dressed like a bird, has this big gutter and bird feet. And uh, it's essentially a sort of temp shelter for urban birds, but we thought of it a bit as a, as a Trojan horse for the pigeons, which we think in Venice has a particular significance. It's sort of bird loved by tourists, hated by the preservation committees, but also like deeply 
uh, part of the city. And um, so kind of a bird that grows with our desires. It depends on the way in which we shape the world and it's somehow today out of control. So maybe like a truly uh, wild kind of emancipated. And this is a quick parenthesis about how also this project for us kind of borders uh, a bit on the personal. When uh, this project started, I was uh, this project or better this kind of interest in, in birds and these objects of relations. I was living in the States. I had a fascination for, for quack furniture. And uh, then it continued when uh, we were in the first lockdown uh, or almost, well, a year and a half ago now. And uh, we, we have a parrot who's called Coco who lives in our studio. And so for him, we started to, to kind of design furniture for him and for ourselves. So we made a series of variation on, on Windsor benches designed to accommodate us both a chair with kind of elongated backrest where he could sit while we were working or eating. And all were coming from this kind of uh, genre of furniture, which is sort of looks pragmatic, but also is extremely whimsical. And uh, then we went on, some became uh, thrones with kind of tall perches, coat hangers where, well, every coat becomes a toy and tables where he could kind of pick on our food or snacks or kind of participate. Um, other elements we made a bit on the theme where this was a platform, which was also later developed for Venice, which is a sort of idea of abstracting very explicitly the ideas of, uh, of nature that kind of come through the cage. So the, the lake would become a water bowl, the mountain, a block of clay, the forest, a series of birches. And um, those were made with sort of edible uh, materials, which would be in, some of them breakable by, by birds, or they would pr uh, provide uh, calcium and things like this, and toys that we could kind of both share. And uh, these were then developed for the Venice Biennale, where actually um, delay after delay, we kind of had a platform that, that grew over uh, a year or so, which became the sort of platform for, for humans and birds, which combined a bit these different scales. So from the pigeon towers of purchase we had in our studio for cock of the models and so on. And um, the second uh, project is, maybe so I do a quick check. Are you still with me, Owen, Sarah? You, everything you hear me yeah we're still here uh yeah keep, keep okay going. <laughs> <laughs> great thanks sorry because it, it went uh, again in this mode where i only see my screen so um, the the second project is the it's called the, the bird's palace and um it's um it's a floating garden which we designed for vondel park which is amsterdam most um one of the most known well in in the netherlands they call it the central park of amsterdam but it's it, it doesn't feel that way, but, but it's, a, it's a beautiful park in the west of the city, in the southwest of the city. And um, we designed it as a floating garden uh, in a way thought for this kind of a, a form of encounter between birds of different categories, the, the sort of the native and the non-native feral and the wild, and their kind of human analog of residents and commuters and students and tourists and so on. So it's, it was a project meant to be explored by people only by means of bird watching. So you would peek between the canopies or the trees or bushes and look at it from the shore with the help of uh, binoculars or cameras. And the relation to us was uh, to the, to the Lustops, which are these pleasure gardens of Amsterdam's Golden Age, which are these kind of secluded private uh, gardens, which were um, only accessible by boat. Ours, of course, is, is um, open to to everyone, but really only accessible to the, to the birds and and dotted by these tall perches and bird feeders that look a bit like abstract birds with beaks to nest in and these bellies full of seeds. These are the, the first duck, ducks always go first, at least this is what we found in our work and um, sort of go, goes inside and of course discovers this as a, as a, as a vast uh, buffet, so that the whole island is essentially a big dish and it slowly begins to be inhabited Egyptian geese, then pigeons, magpies and crows follow the usually a bit more cautious. Uh, and the, the idea was that uh, as the birds would feed and of course like uh, uh, droppings would accumulate on the ground, they would become the, the gardeners of, the, of this place. So they would fertilize the soil, they would seed it and so on. And uh, this was, again, the idea was that um, visitors would never really be able to reach the islands, would really be accessible to birds. Of course, you could reach it in a way to commit to becoming an observer, to becoming, to sort of keeping the distance and enjoying sort of this relation of 
seen and being seen by the birds uh, as this kind of island pivots on the water and to us comes out a bit as a sort of inverted panopticon where we could completely decenter ourselves as well and people where people would be sort of observed by other animals um, we also wanted to this is third i think this will go a little bit faster the it's this is a project we realized for for Artbest, which is the national center for architecture and um, and design of stockholm and it's called utomus Verket, which means kind of public thing or the actions sort of public actions in in a way and uh i it was commissioned as an installation for for the summer months of a, of, a, of a museum this when the museum itself was actually closed and we imagined it as a sort of mineral garden where uh, different frames would intersect and again would become a sort of place of encounter with minerals and kinds of soils and even the possibility of moving ground um in uh, in the public ground uh it's made essentially as a um, as a map so it follows a series of axes that are, or as a sort of observatory so it mark, marks uh, dusk and dawn uh on the equinox um uh, and uh on the solstice and uh so it works a bit like a sort of astronomical clock so on one side it kind of look into a huge context on the other it's very much about the ground itself so there's shells gravel uh, different kinds of shell actually and different kinds of soil that that make this kind of sort of mandala of uh, of, of materials and uh, oh, sorry the um, here and the, the idea would be that these uh, this kind of idea of it as a bit of a as a stage and a place for some kind of uh, horticulture or even drawing on the ground uh, would mix there so one could mix soil dig get your feet wet but also pick flowers and so on where in a way every action would become in a way very uh, theatrical this is this kind of walled frame that uh, that uh, that uh, contained it which was a sort of a sort of elongated chaise long uh, the slope of the sundial where the person would actually be the the, the the pin mark in the sun this was a bird's garden which at the beginning was sort of imagined as a as a almost as an embassy of a swedish forest so we collaborated with a with a um, uh, with a tree nursery from there who brought in beautiful mosses and different types of berries and the Juneberry tree and ivy and was imagined as a kind of a play on the paradox of wilderness and the genre of nature that we we say to love the most but we lo seem to love it the most just because we're not part of it so it was really only accessible to birds so people were only really allowed to peek through and I think the most beautiful thing happened actually during the summer here when when we came back in September and we found that this kind of pristine Swedish forest had been taken over by completely oversized sunflowers which had probably sprouted from from snacks that we had from a 7-eleven close by around the days of the opening which here got completely taken over the space and made it in a way completely urban and, and surreal and much more much more interesting and um, so it, this kind of things, as well as a series of things that happened with the, the, the fauna, with the birds of the of the island of Stepsolmen, made us really think about the project as a form of cultivation that really sort of changes over time. These are some of the elements that kind of provided sort of affordances. This was happening at the same time of our project for Venice Pinale. So some of the production also was working together with Backend. And in Somai, the Italian designer had died the day we received the the call to to begin this project so we also you know we paid tribute to him and we in, reinvented one of his um, animal puzzles as uh, an animal puzzle made entirely with birds and um so it's part of the pond and again this is a space which was imagined uh, to be to provide sort of space also for other species and really to kind of celebrate and almost put them on a stage and of course here the birds imagine immediately read this as 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 a big uh, as a big uh, dish so they, they they immediately found out that the water plants were delicacies so the whole space was essentially a big spa and uh, quite soon they began to bathe in the waters it had these kind of phases where they were uh, the, the the goslings they were the museum was very very good at capitalizing on the cuteness of the whole of the whole situation so they were organizing yoga sessions with the seagull chicks and of course the seagulls were there they were kind of checking in on on on, on their younglings and um they were leaving us a little bit uh, worried actually 
we were uh, slightly preoccupied for the presence of the seagulls, which in fact are also a bit aggressive towards some of the visitors that were very protective of their chicks. And of course, we were worried about the other birds because ducks and geese beneath, of which there was quite an abundance at some point, became in a way the responsibility of the team of uh, curators of Alpes who were there the whole time. So it really gave them the responsibility of being gardeners, of sort of negotiating between the desires of different species humans but also others of course and adjusting almost every day a bit like in a garden in a way what we what they wanted it to be what they wanted to allow to happen and what not to happen which i think gave sort of another and true meaning to the idea of curation there so it was really a sort of idea of taking care of taking care of the human and the non-human uh, inhabitants of the place um oh and i think i have time for the to go through the last project so I, I'm at yeah, 25 yeah. minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. yeah Super. Go ahead. Thanks. And uh, this last project is called Buyukada Songlines, which um, uh, also happened this summer. Of course, this is not all work that was planned to happen this summer. A lot of things were, were postponed. Um, and uh, the, this was uh, imagined uh, in a way commissioned by the Istanbul Design Biennial, but then essentially realized also through a sort of collective effort of uh, stimulating funds in the Netherlands, uh, Istanbul's municipality um, and um, associations in Istanbul who helped with the project. The idea here was, a, 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 our proposal was a, a sort of, what we did was a floating garden to, to, to navigate the waters of uh, Marmara and of the Bosphorus. So to connect an archipelago of islands called the Prince's Island in Istanbul with the cities, Asian and European shores. And uh, so I think what I'll do is I'll want to have a, almost like a photographic journey of a project, but before that, just a, a little bit of a background. Um, starting with these miniatures, which um, show a sort of selection of floating pavilions, which in different moments during Ottoman era inhabited the, the waters of Istanbul. So it's first of all a project that sort of works within a certain uh, tradition of architecture, which we think more than belonging to, to one place or one city really connects uh, cities on water. This is the Teatro del Mondo, and you probably all know it, uh, which sort of combines in a sort of uh, nomadic theater, early Florentine architecture, early Renaissance architecture from Florence, but also Elizabethan theaters, the architecture of lighthouses, and of course, a tradition of these kind of ephemeral scenes that would be set up in Venice for the carnival. Um, this is a project that also had a uh, kind of, I don't know, had a bit of a revival lately, and it's a it's a sketch from uh, from Robert Smithson, which and a project that was only realized, I think, after his death, which was a floating island uh, designed to to navigate around Manhattan. So it's a uh, in a way, I think there's a tradition in which we wanted to fit in with this work, which is not just that of a spatial archetype of the ship or the island, but it's really about being on water as a way to tell stories. So really the, 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 the ship or the barge or the boat as a device for narration. So something that uh, connects, I think, Homer to Conrad, to Stevenson, to Sir Le Guin, to Aldo Rossi, to Robert Smithson. And, it's, uh, and, and it does not belong to one place, let's say. This is uh, uh, Istanbul, most of you probably know this, but of course the, 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 the usual way to describe it is a kind of meeting point of Asia and Europe, but in fact it's a convergence of a lot of things. It's where the Aegean Sea through the Dardanelli Strait and the waters of the, of the Black Sea through the Bosphorus meet. It's also where three cities meet. Uh, typically it's been looked at as the, the kind of settlements of Galatapea, of the Golden Horn, and of Skutai. Um, on the on the kind of three points meeting uh, in uh, on water, and then of course there are the islands which you see on the map, kind of these kind of dots on the south, which are these nine islands five miles from the Asian coast, which have a long history of exile and retreat. They've been ex inhabited for thousands of years. There were Ottoman royalty uh, uh, would be sent to exile. It's a place where Trotsky fled after leaving Soviet Russia. So he lived in Buyukada, the largest of the islands, uh, between 1929 and 1933. And often this kind of multicultural nature uh, corresponds with a kind of, um, uh, this kind of, uh, um, this layered culture is also a layered ecology. So here uh, there's different waters, there's brackish waters of the Black Sea flowing over the saltier waters of the Mediterranean Sea. 
And this is where we started to think of uh, Buyukada songlines. So the Veku in Chatwin's description of the Aboriginal songlines, where we would want to sort of describe and walk in this place um, and um, to uh, through a, a, let's say, a geographical thing in which not draw lines on a map, but rather would sort of try to connect stories and music and knowledge of plants and minerals uh, along a route. So this is actually the route that we followed. It could only be drawn afterwards because, again, on water, <laughs> some things were a bit had to be decided depending a bit on the weather and the circumstances. Um, so we're coming from the Asian shores, heading towards the European ones, almost zigzagging our way through the archipelago. And this was our garden, as it was docked on the commercial port of Buyukada. This was in July this year. And this was the captain the first time he saw uh, he saw the barge. Um, and uh, essentially the, the, the project um, was really about designing a journey. So of course there were designed elements with three installations, which are really a bit more like affordances on the on, on this barge, but mainly we, we worked on this garden and we really thought of it as designing almost like a sort of machine for different kinds of hospitality. So where we could collect plants, uh, matter, but also people and stories. So sort of material and immaterial collection could be could be gathered. Uh, on, on the island. That's another way to, to think about data. And then, of course, a place which uh, could be also quite literally and had to be quite literally cultivated. So where one could talk about water while being on the water you are talking about. So where you could abstract and generalize things, but you could also immediately would be forced to sort of ground them. And uh, where the context that would be always a bit in between all these human abstractions and and metaphors and the, the water and the soil uh, itself. So um, uh, this, uh, the boat uh, uh, moved and of course for us has a, also a bit of a significance to reflect on, on public space and water, which we see as a, as a kind of profoundly democratic surface, water itself, where rules are kind of determined by, by the encounter. They are determined by the wind, by who's more or less maneuverable, so they, there's a system of rules that has to be interpreted at every at every event. And also a place, of course, where there's no real difference between who's a local and who's a tourist. We're all a bit foreign. This is the island of Neandas, which was uh, the first we kind of fear towards, uh, which is said to be inhabited. In fact, it's home to a huge colony of cormorants. The island of Elibeliada, which used to be a source of copper already in Roman times. That small kind of faded island you see in the distance is called Silveyada. And, it has a long history, but one of the most kind of notorious events there was the, essentially the, the, the death of almost 80,000 dogs, which are collected on Istanbul on the mainland and brought to the island to die in 1911. Uh, so this was 80,000 stray dogs. And the island of Yasiada, which is uh, seems next to it, at least from a distance, where politicians and um, academics were tried uh, following the coup in 1960. And this was already used like that by the Byzantines. Actually, they would already send prominent figures to exile there. So on the on the boat, of course, there were a series of stops and a series of guests. So while navigating, we'll be recording conversations. And there was a photographer, there would be some non-human passengers. Uh, there were butterflies kind of almost in the middle of the sea, which was quite spectacular. As we move to the mainland, this is a blue mosque in Asia Sophia, I think, in the distance. And this is, I think, Yenikami and the Mosque of Suleiman as you're about to go under the Galata Bridge before docking in Alich. So the, the longest stop was in Alich for around six weeks uh, before the boat returned to the islands. So it, and then it uh, moved back to the islands where it left, uh, where all the, the plants were donated to the, to, to the, to the city and the, the three elements were essentially installed in a public garden in Buyukada. Uh, While well, of course the, the municipality sponsored the, the barge, the captain, and the and the and the um, uh, and the towing boat itself. So um, I, I think what I wanted to end with this is to sort of suggest the idea that here that the project is really in, in more and almost designing a, a form of hospitality, not a sort of neutral or generic one, but a rather intentional one that could um, with which we were we, we we hope to sort of address in a way the scale of the territory of the sea of the migration, but knowing that we often work with uh, with fragments um, so to try to connect these projects at least for us it's quite important to think about these projects and try to think of them as as, as fragments of a world let's say which can be both places where we represent things but also where we really act even if on on uh, on a small scale
Um, thank you very much. I'm five minutes late. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating um, tour through a whole series of projects and um, some you know, amazing images. I just wish I'd seen some of these things in, in real life, as I'm sure everyone else is, is thinking similarly. So we have some time for some uh, questions or responses from, from the audience. The best thing to do is if you'd like to say something, please put it initially in the chat and then um, it will pop up on our screens and we will go to you and give you the opportunity, if you would like, to um, ask it uh, uh, yourself to take over the, um, to be, uh, uh, Sarah will, uh, will spotlight you while you ask the question. Uh, but in uh, anticipation uh, of questions from the audience, I have a, a few a few things that, um, that I would like to I would like to ask. Um, it, there was just such such a kind of an extraordinary um, body of work, and so sort of charming and surprising, and just this kind of richness and depth to it was just uh, you know one wonderful to to hear about. Um, and I I was very interested because you know you're you're dealing with some incredibly um, complex, um, historically rooted, ecologically rooted, very very serious. Um, ideas but then you uh, address them and explore them in ways that you, you know word you use yourself quite whimsical and I'm thinking of the birdhouse with those kind of wonderful bird feet and the kind of the feathered effect and then the furniture that you built for your um or you designed for yourselves and 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 for your for your parrot and I'm I just wanted to ask to what extent is that a kind of a deliberate tactic that you explore in your work or or is it something that just sort of emerges as as the kind of the natural way to 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 you know deal with these otherwise ex, you know extraordinarily complex ideas and situations yeah uh, no thanks uh, it's it's it is it's a very good question and actually it is the, the conversation Ali and I also keep having because in a way it's almost a language that emerged when we started to work together <laughs> because we were both doing I think slightly different things I mean in part it's um it's very deliberate but it doesn't come as an effort it feels it as a form of liberation just the knowledge of course but any language any language is extremely charged right there is no neutral uh, kind of way to to design and uh um, each of these projects or ideas could be designed in a thousand ways, and each would have a would have something to say. So, of course, we we know what we we know what we want to relate to. We worked a lot with um, with a uh, kind of also visual references, but also with stories. So, I think we always want to pay homage to the things that we found during the way, and often those become uh, become forms. There is something else which um, has a bit to do with, regardless, I think, of the of the of the language of things. I think there is an intention to, uh, and it's one that does come naturally. Like we're never fully aware of of it until we start think about it. But it is to almost make things that people would want to take care of, that we ourselves would want to take care of, because I think we. In a way, we often we almost design the tool, but with our test with the Utomus Verket, it emerges really clearly. That project was I think, beautiful and successful because um, well, we maybe made a good design, but had there not been that level of engagement from the curator, from the team, from the public, uh, of really of cleaning, just really the basic things, you now of deciding when to clean, deciding when there were there was a bit too much mess with the birds. So that level of uh, of care to the place it would not have been there. So I think in a way what we can do is regardless, independently of the, of the formal language, but there is a care to, to materials and to, to the way things are made and, they, and to that they should almost ask to be cared for, sometimes almost in a, in a kind of in a sympathetic way. The pigeon in Venice is a, is a completely a Trojan horse. It's the most uh, hated creature hidden under kind of the most... Uh, uh, you know the, the prettiest shiniest uh, dress 
Um, but I, I think it's important that these objects call for their own care in a way, that they ask to be, yeah, really to be, uh, I don't know, loved or maintained, you know, to. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm muting myself. Um, that, that's really fascinating and kind of hearing about um, how the, the museum staff, the curators kind of, I guess, embraced what you were, what you were trying to do, um, not through necessarily, well, well, directly through the kind of the nature of what you had created as something that uh, demanded or, or kind of promoted a certain level of, of kind of care and, and interest, because it's kind of rather fascinating. You know, one thinks about, you know, um, to make a very crude comparison, uh, you know, something like the Serpentine Pavilion, which, you know, is a similar thing erected outside a museum, but serves a kind of a very different purpose. The, you know, the, the, the role of it um, is to generate press coverage and money, and it sort of has a sort of, prosaic function as a as a cafe and events venue and I sort of wonder like how how did you I mean with with that kind of model as as a backdrop how did those kind of conversations with the museum about the, the, the you know your ideas for this project emerge because I can kind of I can kind of see like in the wings as there's a sort of the, the commercial department thinking oh how can we monetize this so how, <laughs> how did you sort of you know um get it across to them when in the design stage. I think when it, when the thing, you know, manifested, it's very obvious, but, but in those conversations about, you know, presenting the ideas and the design and, and taking them on a, a bit of a journey. How, can you talk a little bit about that? How, how did you go about uh, that process? Yeah. And we, I, I, I don't know if Futamus Vecchi is the best example simply because we had, um, uh, well, uh, James Taylor Foster, who, you know, who was the one who invited us as a curator at our desk and was responsible for this project. And I think he was taking a lot of the uh, questions that are now directed to us <laughs> because it means that for us, we could immediately discuss about what we wanted to do and what they didn't want to do. So if we wanted to work with something that grew, we wanted to do something uh, temporary, but that would be thought of as temporarily there because we worked a bit with the knowledge that for the kind of work we we were thinking, uh, and if you, I don't know, this place in front of our desk is essentially a tarmac strip. It's a square, but it's a, it's a, not an easy place to, to work. It's not a place where you can plant. So also what I think was, um, we made those things a bit clear and I think we we're very uh, much invited to think about these themes. Um, the, uh, I'm taking a bit of a sidetrack, but this, this, uh, this, kind of relationship with uh, having a, let's say, who is going to cultivate the project to that being like a project in its own continued with our test because now the, the, the elements will be reinstalled and will be reused, for instance. So none of it is going wasted, but that was inscribed in the project from the beginning, although maybe not all the answers were there. And this was something they committed to. In terms of uh, uh, helping them see how they, uh, say the PR department, how they would uh, how they propose this. We made a beautiful model, and we made <laughs> you know we made and and the model I think is really really also does that because this kind of scale of affection to the object, we feel it even with the model. I mean we feel it ourselves, but there's almost like a bit of a drive and it has to leave enough open for other people to think and fill in. Um, I'm not sure that answers, but really with ACTES, I think we had it easy <laughs> because uh, there was uh, there was uh, an immediate understanding, I think, from the team there about what, what we wanted to do. Yeah, I bet James is a good advocate internally. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a question in the chat uh, from uh, Shemol. Uh, would you like to ask that yourself? Uh, in which case Sarah will uh, invite you to uh, un unmute you. If Hello, ever can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. Over Hi. To you. Hello. Um, thanks for your presentation. That was great. Um, I just had a question about, I was curious whether um, 
your projects on the encounter with birds or wildlife taught you anything about human interaction um for better or for worse i guess yeah, <laughs> yeah. um I, let's see, there's a, there's maybe a, like a sort of a side considerate thought. Um, and then I, I want to think of some example where I can answer a bit more directly there. But uh, the, 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 the side consideration is that I think that everything that I've shown in a way is made, is about people. Like all the, all the projects I think are deeply about ourselves. And also maybe that goes a bit to feed a bit into the into the language question we're talking about. Um, there's a they they rely on our own capacity as people to adapt and also on the capacity of other animals to adapt to our environment and to react to our to our actions. So I think the this idea of seeing in in people and then thinking that okay, we meet in a place where actually farmers or we are all a bit foreigners or we're asked to be to to explore no and to um, and it's not exactly clear what your interaction is meant to be that kind of produces um a sense of kinship the the the, the, the strongest one is for sure uh with the projects on water when uh, to, to me like meeting someone on water is about like meeting someone in a hike in the sense that there's a there's a need to say hi to someone else and in part, it's nice to see another person. In part, it's safety, right? In part, you're letting your own presence known. So there are things I think in these, in uh, in this kind of encounters, and there are things, and I think it's a similar dynamic in looking at other animals. No, if you look at birds, almost that you think every moment could be about life and death, right? Every moment it's a prey or a predator that you're looking at. So things have a different intensity. So I, I think what they, maybe, yeah, I don't know if it's a bit generic, but perhaps what they teach is that a certain intensity of the experience is uh, also makes us in a way more, <laughs> I don't know how to say a bit more interesting, but let's say the project is about, not about being nice towards birds, but maybe becoming kind of more beautiful as people or more complete or more fulfilled or happy, you know, because we also exist through relations essentially. So. Um, I, I hope this answers a bit. And specific examples, there's good stories and bad stories. But <laughs> Do we have anyone else? Um, well, please, if you have, so we have time for a few more questions. So if you have one, please, please add it in, in the chat. I mean, just, just to um, kind of follow up about the uh, the Yukada song lines I mean the the, the photographs are kind of utterly <laughs> extraordinary um this this floating platform uh, uh, uh working its way um across the water I mean what what were the reactions generally to people seeing this because obviously there's there's the the people who are kind of aware of the project kind of have some sort of sense of expectation of 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 what's going on but to the people who perhaps just suddenly <laughs> kind of, I don't know, look out of the window and see this thing, like, is, was there a way of kind of getting a sense of what that broader reaction was? Because it, you know, it, it surely it's, it's kind of this, this sort of startling, almost kind of magical thing that that that, that people would be seeing. And I, I sort of wonder, like, you know, it, is is there kind of any way of measuring or getting a sense of? Of what the kind of <laughs> passerby felt felt from this felt about seeing this thing. Um, let me see, let me let me think. Well, I mean, I thought what was kind of beautiful was that it it felt somewhat normal when it was in place. Like there was something incredibly uh, surreal about it. Just that you are on water, the horizon is static but it's not the sea or the waves that are moving right because you you have a feeling that you're on land you are walking on gravel actually you're walking on gravel and soil and the plants were moving so there was something incredibly kind of strange in there already but in the let's say in people seeing it uh, i think especially 
kids or people from the island or wherever we brought it. Some events where where there were a lot of programs organized. By the way, the photos before I forget, uh, Ricardo De Vecchi is a photographer who works with us in the Netherlands, traveled to to Istanbul. He absolutely wanted to document this photo, and indeed, it was uh, fantastic and really important to have him. Um, there was a. It felt like quite natural. I mean, after a couple of days, it was in Alice where people dive in from it. There were people fishing from it as they would from the other shores. Mm. Um, it felt, uh, and I think that was a kind of the most beautiful thing that it didn't arrive as an exhibition where you would kind of, you know, visit and at best sort of sip, uh, sip a glass of prosecco or uh, ask permission to get in. Uh, <laughs> it uh, it was misused as well. It was docked there all night. You know, it was um, it was essentially a public space. So I don't know about the surprise. I think the it's hard to measure it. Also, um, we were the most surprised ones that it actually happened. We were the ones that were most most in disbelief that uh, that uh, that uh, something like that actually happened in a moment like that. Of course, with the, all the difficulties of the lockdown and so on. And it was really caught a beautiful moment of, of relief when it actually could work. Yeah, I bet. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, Francesca, uh, Sarah will, will unmute you. So please ask it. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me? We can hear you. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Giovanni. It was very interesting. Um, I loved the, the way you deal with the different scales of the project. I really love the way you're able to design the tiny details, but still have a big idea, which is about landscape somehow. So I was wondering if you can give us an idea of which is your design process. If you have one, how do you approach uh, the question you have? And how do you develop your projects? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer, unfortunately. I mean, I think a lot of projects follow each other. So I, I, I mean, the feeling I have is that more and more we, but even, I think even some of the first projects Ali and I and our team worked on, um, they were always coming from something. So they, they are always the growth of something else. All the projects you saw today are very, very much related. And I think they come from the same kind of uh, drive and from a similar position. In terms of method, I think I was quite transparent about the city of working with models. I think that's really quite important. There's also, of course, an advantage in working with this kind of installations where we are often the client in a way, where we collect the funds and we can we can control, we can decide how we're going to do it, where we can save, where not. So it doesn't, they don't follow the, these uh, projects came, for instance, that's maybe kind of important, they came as art commissions. So even if our approach is architectural, um, while the architecture biennale is maybe a little bit different. And also there, the process was very much about kind of managing and a big team, but let's say the installation in Venice and the, and uh, the Bird's Palace, they were managed uh, for us as, let's say we took them as architects, but um, uh, with the autonomy that other architectural projects don't give. So there we, we could decide a bit our own time and our own method. For sure, like the, the models help us a lot. The, the relation with uh, the artisans and companies we work with, that informs our work. And the fact that, yeah, they never start from a kind of raw concept, I think. They often start as a reflection or as a way to, to develop a bit what started before. And if we do it well, by the end, we don't recognize that, uh, that beginning anymore. So we're not too preoccupied about it, let's say. I mean, Grazie. There you go. <laughs> thanks, I was wondering thanks, if you were Italian for a minute. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Francesca. I mean, just, just to sort of follow, follow up on that. I mean, uh, I'm really interested in that idea of how, how the kind of the projects kind of emerge from each other in this kind of natural, organic way. Can you give us a hint of what might be emerging from this, you know, the, the mm -hmm. body of work that you've shown uh, that's, that's, you know, been on, on display more or less or has been staged all, all of essentially this year. What 
what's coming up if, if you can divulge any of that yeah i mean when um no, i think there's some themes that we feel are becoming like more and more urgent for us to develop and often like it's a bit hard to say uh urgencies there are definitely urgencies for us and we inhabit the world so we can we're sure we can communicate them and we'll find a way to communicate them one thing is for sure certainly this idea of kind of of cultivation so of uh, of trying to to get ourselves in a place where we can actually we're given projects that we can follow or that have an embedded idea of kind of following of maintenance which is not a kind of obstinate preservation of a you know of a status quo <laughs> of a project date open that uh, that are need to be kept a bit like a, a garden a bit like Uta Musvaket and how far we'll be able to bring this in the realm of architecture because of course that's a thinking that belongs to to not even to landscape more like to farming or really to gardening actually uh, we'll see but uh, that's something we're very much interested in and I think that, I don't know if it's been the isolation or this kind of confusion of being in your room, but being everywhere, but this kind of scale of Otomos Verket where we're working with these maps and started to look at this place as an observatory and to kind of completely, you know, we decontextualize people. We find that rather reassuring. I don't even know exactly how, but like to, to measure our own smallness and in a way get ourselves a bit out of the out of the center of the picture, but just become someone who is looking at the picture and who can act on the picture. Um, I think that's that's scale, which doesn't mean like that we we'll necessarily want to build something huge, but actually that we want to look at very big things. Um, maybe that is that is also so. I yeah, I think uh, the scale of like really hands in the ground and and but also this uh, kind of cosmic scales <laughs> where they meet i think there's something beautiful well that's a really kind of poetic way uh, to end we have to draw things to a close it's gone um 8 30 uh, thank you um ever so much for a really um fascinating uh presentation and, and discussion we pick up the series again in the new year uh, with Alice Brownfield, who is uh, an architect. She's chair of Part W, is a trustee for Action on Empty Homes and is associate director at Peter Barber Architects. She's speaking on the 20th of January, so please do join us for that. Details are on farrellcentre.org.uk where you can sign up for our e-newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, but thank you again, uh, Giovanni, and thank you everyone for listening. Pleasure, Owen. Until next time. Yeah, until next time. Bye. <laughs>